So you thought the Silver Favorite Things video was good enough that you decided to join me for a few of my favorite things in gold. I am so pleased that you are with me here again today. This is a few of my favorite things from my stack of gold items, and this is once again a celebration of my one-year anniversary on YouTube, the one-year anniversary of this channel. If you are coming from the first video where I covered some of my favorite things in silver and talked about some of those statistics from this first year, uh, I appreciate you being with me here today. If you haven't yet watched that one, maybe go back and watch that one first. It's not like there's any kind of special order. It just kind of makes more sense, I think, to go from statistics to silver to gold. If you are new to the channel, my name is White Cross. Uh, you can call me White. You can call me Dub C. I answer to pretty much anything. And if you are new to the channel, I would like to offer you the opportunity to subscribe to this channel, continue with this um, community that we've built here in the last year. If you were one of my returning subscribers, thank you guys as always for being with me here again today. Today we're going to be talking about a few of my favorite things in gold. And I mentioned in the last video that I wasn't really talking about uh, my more interesting numismatic pieces. And believe me, I, I, you know, I, I've built a collection over the last almost 50 years now of pieces that really mean something to me, and that's the core of my coin collection. But I am constantly bridging that gap that I talk about between coin collecting and bullion stacking. So that's what we're kind of looking at here. Hopefully I'm going to be presenting you with some kind of interesting things, make this as interesting as I can. If uh, you are new to the channel, I like to begin my videos with a simple disclaimer. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not trying to offer any kind of financial advice. I'm simply trying to share some of my experience having bought and sold precious metals and rare coins for the last 30 or 40 years, and then some. Uh, and I also like to begin my videos with a simple concept that we can work back in it into the subject of the video. You remember from the last video, we talked about the idea of a bargain. Now, I, I wanted to make sure that you understood what I was saying there. Uh, you know, I think of the, the extra, the little special, something that makes your items in your stack a little bit more interesting. And, and for me, one of those things is being able to get something at a good price. Uh, if you have, if you're presented with the most amazing coin ever, and it's perfect for your collection. It really embodies everything, any reason that you are collecting or the most beautiful silver bar that you've ever seen. But you are looking at it in a full retail environment where somebody is charging as much as it should be and then, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent premium on top of that. I can't stomach doing that. You know, that almost kind of ruins it for me. For me, at least, something has to be available to me at a price that I think is fair and ideally something that's even better than fair. That's what really adds something to the stack. That's what keeps me going. It's that hunt. It's that finding those pieces. It's the accumulation of knowledge and information that I've gleaned over the last 30 or 40 years to kind of help me put me in a position where I can recognize something. And it's also the use of Tom's Law. And we've talked about Tom's Law many times on this uh, channel. Tom's Law is just the idea that if, for as long as you've, as you've been doing this, for me, that example is 30 or 40 years, if you've never seen something before that fits really well in your core stack, your core collection, you come across it for the first time, it may be that length of time again before you encounter that item. So for me, if I'm coming across something that is really interesting and fascinating, it's something that I've probably never seen in 30 or 40 years of doing this. It could be 30 or 40 years longer before I see that piece again, and that's one of the reasons why I pick up interesting pieces. But you have to kind of balance that without paying too much for it. So the concept we're talking about here today uh, is the concept of holding and keeping something. Hopefully you're buying pieces that aren't overpriced. Once in a while, you'll know in your gut when you see something and you don't mind paying close to full retail, or it pains me to say this, even paying full retail. But I can tell you one thing after having done this for as many years as I have, is that as long as you are buying quality pieces, and that is really important, quality, good quality pieces with integrity, um, then over time, all things considered, you're probably going to be okay in terms of pricing. And I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about as we go deeper into these a few of my favorite things in gold. The definition, hold and keep, that's really what I'm trying to say. You know, even somebody who is not the most astute, 
who doesn't really know the market, doesn't time the market, isn't paying attention to trends, as long as you're buying really good pieces with integrity for coins that might be pieces that were graded early by a, a significant third-party grader that have you know, maybe a CAC sticker on them. These are pieces that are low mintage. These are pieces that have never been messed with. They haven't been cleaned. You can't, don't see hairlines on them. They don't have any PVC corrosion. They are an exceptional con state of condition and they are a rare mintage. Generally speaking, I have found over time that if you buy those pieces and you do nothing with them but protect them to keep that attrition away, our old friend attrition, as long as you are buying really well, even if you're paying, paying close to full retail for it, over time, in my experience, you're probably going to be okay price-wise. So the concept of holding and keeping is just that. You're buying good pieces and you're keeping them for a very long time. And if you do that, in my uh, experience at least, I wind up looking like a genius because you know, 15, 20 years later, all of a the sudden these pieces that I had to kind of stretch to be able to buy back in the day are worth significantly more than I paid for them. And it looked like I was I knew what I was doing all along, but really, you know, this is the kind of journey that you have to feel your way through sometimes. But I stayed true to that concept of buying better quality pieces over time. And that's really what we're gonna see in some of these examples. So let's get into it. <clears throat> a full year of doing this, can you believe it? Can you believe that you've sat with me for a full year while I've droned on and on about gold and silver? <laughs> Thank you again, everybody who has joined me on this journey. Let's talk about a few of my favorite things. And again, these are not my favorite numismatic pieces in gold, and these are just some of my favorite things. You've seen me talk about some of these before. We're going to start here with this one. And I actually did an entire video on this particular piece. This is a fascinating piece. This is an enigmatic piece, and this is a really neat piece. This is, in 1945, Saudi Arabia, four pounds. But what makes this interesting, besides the fact that it's a great big coin made out of solid gold, is that it says U.S. Mint Philadelphia, USA on it. Uh, and that should raise some red flags. Immediately, you should think, well, why does it say Saudi Arabia when this is clearly made by the United States Mint? And the, the reason is American citizens could not own bullion, at least significant amounts of bullion. We could own up to $100 face value, and you see $100 face value up here at the top in $20 gold pieces. We could own $100, $100 face value in gold at this period of time, but these pieces were really made for another country, and that kind of uh, rubbed Americans the wrong way, or at least it would have if they'd found out about it. While they weren't supposed to be owning gold, America was making and shipping gold coins overseas to another country. And these pieces are uh, often referred to as um, pieces that were made for Aramco, that it is an American oil company, to pay for oil rights in Saudi Arabia. But as I said in that video, and I'll put a link to it down below, that that's not the case. That's not actually what happened. It would have been illegal for Aramco to own gold also. Corporations were limited the same way that American citizens were um, with this uh, presidential declaration 6102 signed by Franklin Roosevelt, this executive order. That stopped American citizens from owning bullion, also stopped American corporations from owning bullion. So it wouldn't have worked. So if you have ever seen these pieces before, uh, you know that there's a lot of uh, people who say that these are uh, made to pay for oil rights to Aramco, uh, from Aramco to Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It's just not true. That's not really what happened. Uh, more likely, Saudi Arabia was allowed to own or to buy gold from the United States government, and that's probably what they did. So these pieces made for Saudi Arabia, even though they say United States meant all over them, and that's definitely one of our symbols, these are not considered an American gold piece, but it's history, it's size of gold. And this is 31.95 grams of 0.917, that's 22 karat gold if you're scoring at home, means that each one of these contains 0.942 of a troy ounce of uh, versus a $20 gold piece like this one up here. <clears throat> this is 0.967, so this is 0.942. You can see that there are a hundredths of an ounce away from each other. That's how big these Saudi Arabian pieces are. They are almost a full troy ounce of pure gold. Um, 
they're a fascinating piece. What makes it one of my favorite things? I bought this at auction. I got it at a really good price. Um, you know, I first started finding out about these pieces about 20, 25 years ago. And I got to a point where I had a little bit of extra money. Uh, heritage auctions, which I have mentioned many times before on this channel, was having an auction where they had three or maybe four pieces that were very similar from the style. Those pieces were all a slightly higher grade. You can see that this one is AU58 on that Sheldon grading scale of 1 to 70. So this is not technically an uncirculated coin. This is about uncirculated at 58. But I figured with this device and with these great big broad fields, it's not like there was a whole lot of detail that could be worn down. Sure, this piece has some bag marks. You know, it was knocked around. It was shipped overseas and probably handled pretty roughly at the time. It wasn't a coin coin. It was really more of a bullion item. So uh, I figured I could save a few dollars by bidding on the lower graded one examples because the other examples were actually in the uncirculated range of 60 to 70. And sure enough, those pieces went for pretty good money. And this piece actually sold for very close to melt, melt plus maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars, I think. Definitely go ahead and watch that video if you haven't. I think it's kind of an interesting uh, dip into that. That's called, uh, let me see if I've got it here, Top Secret Gold of World War II. That's the name of the video. So I'll put a link down to the, uh, that video below. So that's what makes it one of my favorite things. It's neat. It's got some history. It's got some age to it. It's an unusual purity for the United States. It clearly was made by the United States Mint, even though it says Saudi Arabia on the slab. And I have argued with the folks at Red Book to try to get it in, uh, included into it, and maybe eventually this will become part of our American gold coin heritage. But for right now, it occupies kind of an interesting, fascinating gray area, and that's what makes it one of my favorite things. Uh, moving right along as we go on this countdown of number five to number one. And again, these aren't in any particular order, and they are also excluding most of my, uh, you know, fancy numismatic collectible coins. Number two is this piece in this fancy box. Do you recognize this box? Do you recognize the colors of this box? These colors represent a country, uh, and I'll give you just a second to think about it. No? Okay. Uh, this piece is a gold coin that celebrates the life of Bob Marley, the singer, the reggae singer. Uh, and this was actually made in Jamaica. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was actually made in the London Mint, as you can see here from the, the Royal London Mint COA that came along with it. Uh, you know, uh, Jamaica is a, actually a Commonwealth country, still is to this day, so it makes sense that the London Mint would have struck these. 1995, this is a gold proof $100 gold piece from Jamaica, and it celebrates the 50th anniversary of the birth of Bob Marley, believe it or not. This piece uh, was released in 1995. That was only 14 years after his death. Bob Marley died in 1981. Uh, released by the Royal Mint, it's 15.98 grams, again, of 0.917, just like the Saudi gold piece that we looked at. If that uh, figure sounds familiar, that's 22 karat gold that's often called crown gold. The reason it's called crown gold is that that was the standard that was used in the UK for a couple of hundred years. So 22 karat gold. It is essentially a, a double sovereign, I believe. That's the weight. And why is it my favorite? Or one of my favorite things? Bob Marley got me through some pretty rough times early in my career in my main business. Uh, I was facing kind of a daunting period of time, and I was really kind of by myself. I didn't have any employees that I could lean on. I didn't really have any friends or family that was uh, available for what I needed to accomplish in this uh, about a six month stretch. So I kind of learned just how much steel I have in me. And one of the ways I was able to do that is I had Bob Marley's gold uh, record, that's the collection of his greatest hits, on continual repeat while I was doing this. And he kind of helped me through some tough times. I know that there are other people out there who've gone through tough times and you remember the songs that you listened to that kind of helped you, that kind of pushed you along. And that's really how I felt about this. So I had an opportunity to buy one of these. Uh, <clears throat> I scrimped and saved and I got enough money. This one actually is a very low mintage. There are only 2,000 of these pieces made. And at the time uh, that I bought this, I bought this in January of 2010, so it's been coming up on 15 years now since I bought this. It was a stretch for me to be able to afford this, but I was already a pretty solid stacker, and I knew uh, what my limitations were. This piece came up, the tie to Bob Marley, the fact that it had an incredibly small mintage of just 2,000 pieces. And if you saw it when I took out the, uh, the COA, 
This piece is number 62. So this is a really, really low figure for uh, this piece that was already an incredibly small mintage. And I'll show you uh, how much I paid for this when I bought it in January of 2010. $714. Now that's with shipping. I actually paid $694.95 for it. Can you believe that? Uh, that was a good price just based on gold. But here I'll show you an example of what these pieces sell for if you can find them now. I think that these are in pretty strong hands the same way that this piece is one of my favorite things. It's not going anywhere. This is definitely one of my favorite bullion items. It doesn't quite make it to one of my favorite coin items. But that's what really makes this one special. Uh, and there's no other better time to be sharing this with you guys than my anniversary special. So I hope that you appreciate it too. And I, <clears throat> I just wanna say, if you find yourself going through a rough patch, uh, you can find the strength within yourself. I believe that you can. And if you need Bob Marley to sing to you while you're doing it, take advantage of that. But uh, if you can get the help that you need and keep on going, this is uh, kind of to show you that there is light at the end of the tunnel. On the other side of those difficulties that life throws at you, uh, you can uh, persevere. And uh, sometimes you actually make out well in the end. Um, it's just a beautiful piece. And it reminds me of that period of time. It reminds me of that struggle and how I overcame that struggle. And I did. Uh, and I went on to become relatively successful, if I do say so myself. So um, we're going to keep that there. Number three on this countdown, number four on this countdown of one uh, from five to one on my favorite things in gold. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, let's take this one. Like I said, these aren't really in any specific order. Now, you've seen this one before. This is a Mexican 50 peso. This is a 1930, and this is a PCGS graded MS-63. That's a pretty good piece. Um, this is Mexico's largest gold coin. They say this is the largest circulating gold coin. Of course, if you recognize that uh, device on it, this winged liberty that you see here, it is the same winged liberty that you see on the classic Libertads, and even the same liberty that's uh, expressed on the modern Libertads. It's just a three-quarter view of her. But this exact form is what you see on the classic Libertads. And that's one of the things that I like about this piece. I like the Libertads before I even knew that these pieces existed. Mexico's largest circulating gold coin, circulating again in air quotes, because did these actually circulate? Who knows? Probably not. Uh, 41.666 grams of 900 pure gold. Uh, so this is 1.2057 troy ounces of pure gold, 1.2 and change. That's how big this is. So these dwarf, the American $20 gold piece, uh, they are uh, an exceptional thing to have. I've, uh, since I found out about them, I like them quite a bit. I bought this piece about 17 years ago. Can you believe that? Yeah, I've actually been doing this that long. To remember what I said at the beginning of this video, that sometimes holding and keeping makes you look like a genius. Uh, so I've been doing this long enough that I can kind of get a feel for when gold and silver are... Uh, lower than they probably should be. Now, I don't want to get myself in trouble saying that because a lot of people, especially folks who are kind of new to this, have seen this market going up and up and up since they joined in on it. But it's not the case. Gold and silver fluctuate. And in just the last 10 years, gold has been significantly less than it is now. Silver as well have been way, way, way lower than they are now. But I've been doing this long enough that I kind of, you know, it's one of those things where you stick your finger in your mouth and hold it up to the wind to see which way the wind is blowing. And you kind of get a feel for when gold and silver are discounted. I don't have any scientific method of doing that. I just really kind of get a feel for it. You suddenly realize while you're looking at Kitco or one of the other websites that explains what the daily gold price is, that, wow, that is really lower than I than I remembered it being. That it really feels like that's a really good time to buy. And you can also feel the same way. You can look at those prices like we're seeing right now and say, hmm, maybe it's the time to tap the brakes on, on buying gold. This just seems like it's a lot higher than maybe it should be. I don't wanna mislead you. That's kind of my own opinion. But once in a while, you kind of get that feeling that gold is underpriced. And I had a little bit of money in my pocket at this period of time. And I thought, if I'm going to do this, I might as well do it. So back about 17 years ago, in fact, it was March 2nd of 2007. 
when I found this piece online. I bought this piece from Northern Nevada Coin. Yes, I do keep a lot of my receipts. It's just me being the collector that I am, always have been. Uh, you keep original receipts with interesting pieces. It gives you the ability to make videos some point in the future. How much did I pay for it? Uh, 860 bucks, and that's with shipping and handling. Yeah, I bought this 1.2 ounce gold coin and change, 1.2 troy ounces of pure gold and change for $860 back in 2007. So that's what makes it one of my favorite things. It's a PCGS coin. This is a, a MS63 from PCGS. It's a pretty good grade. It is uh, one of the better dates in this series. They're about 15 date run in this series from, I believe, 1923. That's the kind of one year, a 100 year anniversary of Mexican independence. Independence. So I think they made these centenarios, another name for these, meaning 100 years. I think they started in 1923 and they finished the series in 1947, skipping a, here, a few years here and there. But this is uh, number three in terms of lowest mintage. Uh, this mintage um, better than most of the in the 15 year date run, and I paid 860 bucks for it. So this is an example of that hold and keep that I was talking about. If you went whoa when you saw that 860, and believe me, I do that myself once in a while. It makes me look like a genius, but I didn't know that gold was going to go up to $2,000 an ounce. Uh, you know, you kind of suspect and you hope that it will uh, continue to increase in value versus American currency. That's one of the reasons why I hold gold in the first place. But, you know, I, I didn't, if somebody would have asked me 17 years from now, is gold going to be $2,000 an ounce? I probably would have laughed and said, no way. So the fact that I paid $860 for 1.2 ounces of gold uh, just goes to show you that even if you're not a genius, if you're buying good pieces, a PCGS graded coin, a lower mintage, an MS63 coin, I was able to buy it when those winds felt that gold was a little bit depressed and priced, and I, I make it makes me look like I know what I'm talking about when really I just bought well and held on to it. It's not like I was buying and selling continuously to get to this point with that coin. So buy and hold, that's why it, it's one of my favorite things. Uh, next up on this list would have to be this piece. I have talked about this piece a little bit before, but I'll tell you exactly why it's some of my favorite things. This is the 1950 Peruvian Gold 100 Souls. This is an MS64 proof-like, and you can see it's got kind of mirrored fields there where it shows that black and white contrast. That's what makes this piece kind of neat. Uh, not necessarily what makes it one of my favorite things. Uh, this piece came about when I had concluded a business deal, and I had probably more money than brains for the first time really in my life. And I uh, decided that I wanted to pursue the biggest circulating gold coin. You know, if a $20 gold piece is a pretty good piece, if a 50 peso is a really good piece, is there anything bigger than that? And the answer is yes. The Peruvian 100 souls. Uh, this is probably the largest circulating gold coin that's ever been made in terms of weight. Again, did they actually circulate? We know that they made concurrent paper money, right? That representative currency that went along with these. And you probably could have exchanged the 50 or the 100 uh, note, 100 soul note for this. I, I kind of doubt that they ever circulated in the way that we kind of think of coins circulating, but there's no doubt that they released these on a regular basis. This was when gold was still being used in some countries. So I like to qualify and say, sure, this was probably a circulating piece, but who knows for sure. 48.807 grams of 900 pure gold. And you can actually see all of the information about it, uh, it says right here, the grams and the, the fact that it's in fine gold. Uh, this is um, 1.354 of a troy ounce of pure gold. Uh, and then we've got some more information around the outside here. There's the, 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 the raw weight of it too. So this piece at 1.35 troy ounces dwarfs the 50 peso at 1.205. So 1.354, 1.205. And yes, that makes it significantly larger than an American $20 gold piece. These are also a very limited run. I bought this from Heritage in 2017, and I got what I think was a pretty good price on it. Why is it one of my favorite things? This kind of represents the conclusion of that business deal. I like to kind of collect not so much trophies. You can call it a trophy if you want to. It's really just something to remind me of that period of time, not unlike the Bob Marley piece that we talked about earlier. So what makes this one of my favorite things is the fact that it is a huge gold coin, one of the biggest circulating gold coins that's ever been made. 
I bought it well. It is an NGC graded MS64 proof like, so it's got that PL designation. These are a relatively small mintage coin as well. And all of those things combined make this one of my favorite things. Well, that takes us from number five, uh, five, four, three, two, right? I think that's the order that we went in. Again, there's not a really specific order to these, but that leads us up to the number one item. <clears throat> and the number one item is kind of an interesting piece to me, at least. And it's, you know, I showed in the silver favorite things video several things that weren't kind of classically bullion. They weren't kind of classically coins. And the same is true of my favorite gold things. And this is something that has meant something to me on a daily basis, literally since I bought it. This is a, a gold bot chain, uh, bot, B-A-H-T. Bot is the traditional Southeast Asian weight that weighs about 15.1 grams. So a bot is a weight that weighs about half of a troy ounce. Uh, it, it's also the official currency of Thailand. So if you're in Th Thailand, you're spinning bots rather than dollars, B-A-H-T. That's the official currency. In that sense, it's kind of like the peso in Mexico and many other uh, Central and South American countries. The peso literally means weight. Bot means weight kind of the same way. And it's also a traditional form of very high carat gold jewelry. It should come as no surprise that I like precious metals. <laughs> Uh, and I had reached another milestone in my life many, many years ago, um, way back in 2005. So that's going back just about 20 years now. And again, it was one of those periods of time where the winds of change seemed to suggest that gold was really, really low. In fact, I think right about this time, gold was trading for just over $500 an ounce. So I decided that I had a little bit of spending money. I liked gold. I liked it having it on my body. And I had uh, dabbled with the idea of collectible watches back in the day, but they had never really uh, kind of meant much to me the same way that other uh, forms of precious metals and even jewelry had. They just didn't really do anything for me. And I think a lot of it had to do with seeing cell phones on the horizon. We knew that with the invention of cell phones to the point where we have them now, where they are an extension of ourselves, they are a computer that's embedded in us most of the time. You know, the fact that they have the, the time on them makes a watch, no matter how fancy a watch is, it makes it kind of obsolete. And I always kind of felt that a really nice watch, and I don't want to harp on the subject too much because I know there's a lot of guys out there who collect watches. Nothing wrong with that. Believe me, I get it. Um, I've got a few. Um, it just seemed kind of superfluous and not in a good way. It just seems like an overly complicated, no pun intended, a way to have to show off your wealth and, and I've always kind of been a low-key kind of guy I do okay I do perfectly fine but it's not something I really wanted to broadcast and the kind of people that would be impressed with a nice big fancy Rolex tend to be the kind of people that I would kind of steer clear of in the first place again you Rolex guys I, I totally get it and I'm not trying to beat you up there so uh, I had this uh, a little bit of cash I realized the price of gold was really low and I like the idea of bot jewelry. So bot also is a traditional form of jewelry that's made in Southeast Asia. And the thing that separates this type of jewelry, and I'll show you an example of it here, from the kind of jewelry that we're used to in the United States, is that the people that make this jewelry are really specialists in their field. Let me see if I can get it to focus a little bit more. So uh, they know what they're doing. They take a raw uh, resource, like an ounce of gold, in this case that this was made from a, a 10 ounce bar, Canadian Royal Mint bar, and, and they can craft it into a necklace very quickly. They use uh, dyes, they use uh, really interesting techniques that they're intimately familiar with. They tend to not have chains. You don't buy this uh, chain, I mean like in a group of stores, not as in terms of a necklace. Uh, they usually have one store and it's usually one guy or one family that makes these. Consequently, they have incredibly low overhead. They don't really go for the whole retail wholesale situation. There's no middleman. There's no chain. They don't have to keep the lights on in the mall somewhere. They don't have to pay a lot of employees. It's usually just them or maybe one or two people that work with them. So the nice thing about these pieces is that the percentage over the value of the gold is usually quite small. If you were to buy a nice gold necklace at uh, you know one of the jewelry stores at the mall, you probably pay 200% over the value of the gold, maybe 300%, maybe 400%, sometimes 500%. So you're buying a necklace that contains 
$50 worth of gold or $100 worth of gold and you're paying six, seven, eight hundred dollars for it. And it's low carat gold. It's typically 14 carats, sometimes 10 carats, sometimes 18 carat. But most of the time, Americans are buying 14 carat gold. 14 carat gold is 58% pure. To me, 58% is barely passing. Uh, if you think of it in terms of a grade, we would say a 58% is a fail, right? Why would you wear gold, especially if you are like me, consumed and obsessed with precious metals? So I reached out to a small firm in Canada who at the time was making high carat gold jewelry, bot jewelry. This is a traditional Southeast Asian design. And I asked if they could make a necklace for me that weighed about two troy ounces. And after some negotiations, we talked about design styles. They came up with this. This was actually made by a Vietnamese craftsmen in Canada out of a 10 ounce Royal Canadian Mint bar. Obviously they didn't use the entire weight. Uh, and this is a piece that I wore for many years. Uh, hopefully you can see uh, as we try to get, uh, let's see if I can get this to Troy Ounces. I think that's Troy Ounces. <laughs> Let me just check real fast. Yeah, okay, so that's Troy Ounces. Uh, and let's see how many ounces this weighs. Now, like I said, I bought this years ago, or we're right at two ounces. I, sometimes I get lucky. Uh, so I bought this back in 2005. At the time, I paid $1,100 for it. So this is two ounces of 24 karat gold. Yes, you can make jewelry out of 24 karat gold, regardless of what you have been told. Most of the world buys 22 karat gold, 23 karat gold, 24 karat gold. Everybody in India, everybody in Southeast Asia, many people in China, they all expect jewelry to be made out of pure gold or very close to pure gold. They would laugh at the idea of 10 karat or 14 karat gold jewelry. So this was a daily wear piece for me. Typically, I would wear it under my shirt in the summertime. If I was wearing a t-shirt, I would wear it over the shirt. And the thing is that nobody would recognize it unless you're from a Southeast Asian country. And one of the tells is this uh, W or dragon style clasp on it. Pure gold is so soft that there are no moving parts to these clasps. You literally bend the clasp, uh, clasp open to open it, and then you bend it and pinch it shut. Uh, that sounds a little bit terrifying if you're talking about two ounces of pure gold, but this necklace was large enough that I rarely open the clasp. In fact, I think I probably didn't do it very often at all. You just slip it over your head. So a 24 karat gold necklace that I bought for $1,100 that weighs exactly two troy ounces way back almost 20 years ago. But that's not really one of my favorite things, although I am still fond of this necklace and I still do wear it occasionally. In the summer of 2018, I noticed that gold had dropped again. Now, it was definitely more expensive than when I bought this original piece. In fact, it was about, I want to say it was about $1,150 an ounce that you can check the gold prices and, and correct me if I'm wrong. And I found a local jeweler in St. Paul, Minnesota, who specializes in gold jewelry. They're actually called 9999 Gold Jewelry. I believe that's the name of the shop. I'll put a picture of their store on it. You can find them online. They're on Instagram. They're on Facebook. And I corresponded with the owner of that store and their main silversmith, uh, Goldsmith. And I kind of explained that I was interested in finding a necklace and buying a necklace that was a little bit larger than this piece. I had kind of achieved, achieved another level in my life. I wanted to have something that was a little bit more substantial. While I like this traditional style quite a bit, the expression that a chain is only as strong as its weakest length always comes to mind. And I'll try to zoom in here. You see these actual links right here are quite small. The pieces that add those, uh, that connect them together, those little rings, those little rings like that. Uh, the idea of losing this piece bothered me. So I wanted something a little bit more substantial. So I, I went back and forth with the owner of the store, with their main goldsmith. We talked about styles. We talked about weights. This was summer of 2018. And I wanted something that was maybe twice the weight of the original piece. Uh, and we finally settled on 156 grams. So that was just over five troy ounces of gold. Now, again, one, two, three, four, five. And these don't even weigh a full troy ounce. So you can see that this is going to be a pretty substantial necklace. Uh, we settled on 28 inches, and, and I decided that because I wanted something that I could slip over my head, I didn't want to use the dragon clasp, but I wanted to include it because it identifies it as being a type of jewelry that is made by these bot goldsmiths who make a very high carat gold jewelry. I wanted it to kind of identify itself without it having to explain exactly what it was. So a 28-inch uh, necklace would allow me to slip it over my head easily. 
and I went with an, uh, kind of a modified anchor style. Now, a lot of anchors chains actually have a little bar that goes across each individual link. This piece didn't, but it was a very close style. So uh, I closed the deal in August of 2019, and I paid $7,250, which, if my calculations are correct, is about 20% over and above the value of the gold. You can see that 20% of the value versus two or three or 400 or more buying a piece at the mall, and there's no way you would be able to buy a piece like this at your local mall. And also to have something that was custom made for me, exactly what I wanted, exactly the weight I wanted, the exact length that I wanted, the exact purity that I wanted, 20% over and above the value of the gold. Come on now. But uh, enough of the delay. I showed this piece really briefly. I do wear this necklace almost every single day, and I have since 2018. So we're coming up on about six years since I bought this. Every single day it's around my neck. And this is it. This <clears throat> is a five troy ounce pure gold necklace, and we know that. Not only because it's stamped. Let's see if I can bring it in and see what the markings are. That one says 24 karat gold. This one says 9999. Uh, this is a beast of a necklace, but it doesn't look that um, kind of gaudy when it's actually on me. At least I don't think it is. Probably other people think that it is. But to me, it just looks like a simple chain. You know, it's a little bit heavier uh, style than you might expect for a chain like this. But it looks like a gold chain. And because it's a little bit larger, you wouldn't expect that this is even real. Most people who see this probably think that it's just costume jewelry, gold-plated silver, or something like that. They wouldn't stop to think that this is actually five troy ounces of pure gold, and that's essentially what it is. Now, I do wear this every single day. Sometimes I do wear this outside of my shirt if I'm just wearing a t-shirt, short, uh, shorts, and, and uh, tennis shoes. And you would have no idea that that old dude over there is wearing five troy ounces of pure gold around his neck. It just looks like a fashion necklace. It really does. But I know what it is, and it means a lot to me. <clears throat> Let's see if we can get a weight here. I haven't weighed this in a long time, so we're going to see just exactly how much it weighs. Well, it still weighs exactly what it was supposed to. Hopefully you can see that at 5.01 troy ounces. Like I said, it was just a hair over uh, 5 ounces so that I would know in my heart that it was at least 5 troy ounces of pure gold. Definitely one of my favorite things. Something that I have worn almost every single day for the last 5 or 6 years now. Uh, something that I am proud to own. Something that really is kind of representative of who I am. And it's... Uh, you know, sub substantially less expensive than a, that gold Rolex would have been. But this is something that I can wear close to my skin, that I can feel, that I'm in contact with all the time. If you are a gold stacker, if you are a silver stacker, you know that feeling. You know wanting to have something on you. It's why a lot of guys carry a pocket piece. It's why a lot of guys you know, wear those heavy gold watches. Uh, and this is just one of those personal things that means a lot to me, but I wanted to share it with you. I've showed it really, really briefly before, but now you have an idea of this is what I wear pretty much every single day. So uh, how many ounces do we have here total? Uh, this is 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 ounces of pure gold. You can do the math on that one. Uh, five of my favorite things when it comes to gold. Uh, you know, this is my one year anniversary special. I wanted to share with you guys some of the things that mean something to me and hopefully explain exactly why they do mean something to me. Uh, some of my favorite things in gold, following up that video, some of my favorite things in silver. Um, what do you think? Tell me which is your favorite piece here. Um, I, the Marley piece means a lot to me uh, sentimentally. The um, 50 peso at a period of time where I had to really stretch to be able to buy it. The Saudi piece, uh, because it's got so much intrigue and so much mystery behind it. We still don't really understand exactly why these were made, who made them, and what they were made for. We're learning more of that information. Again, watch that video if you have any interest in taking a deeper dive in these pieces. The Peruvian 50 souls, because it's the largest circulating gold coin, or kind of circulating gold coin of all time. And the, the bot necklace, because it's a personal item of mine that I wear on a regular basis to kind of remind me who I am. Uh, and then you've just got some really cool $20 gold pieces up top just to look pretty. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have any suggestions, if you want to leave a comment down below, tell me which of these pieces you like the best, which of these pieces you'd like to have. Don't just go by weight. I mean, of course, five troy ounces of pure gold, duh. But which of these pieces do you think is most interesting? Which of the pieces would you like to have in your own collection? 
Uh, if you have suggestions of other videos, by all means, go ahead and leave a comment down below. I'd like to hear your thoughts, as always. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, uh, take a second, subscribe to the channel, see what else I have. Uh, you know, this one year anniversary special means that I've got about 75 videos that you can choose from, and I've got tons more coming down the line. We've got a great series coming up very soon, lots of other topics that we're going to be talking about. If there are topics you'd like to hear me do, leave a comment down below. If you've got a question, I like to say that if you've got a question about these pieces, there's a very good chance that somebody else has that same question. Let's answer it for everybody. And as always, Thank you guys sincerely for allowing me to be a part of your journey as you go deeper into the world of coins and physical precious metals.